What's up, everyone? Welcome to our Druid Summit session, Demystifying Druid Myths. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, a little bit about who we are. Uh, I'm Rena Leone. I am a senior developer evangelist here at Imply, and I'm also the host of the Tales at Scale podcast. If I sound a little bit familiar, I'll throw it over to Sergio. Hi, I'm Sergio Farragut. I'm a senior developer advocate at Imply, and I'll throw it over to Helmar. Hi, I'm Helmar. I'm a senior sales engineer at Imply. And today we are going to be talking about some common misconceptions about Apache Druid, what it should be used for, what it maybe shouldn't be used for, and what stuff is just a plain old rumor and myth. Now, there's one that keeps coming up, and I'm sure if you're here, you already know it. It's that Druid doesn't do joins, but that's not actually true. It's definitely one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, about Apache Druid. So let's just address it. Druid does do joins, it just does them a little bit differently. And that's because it's not a relational database. So table joins don't quite work like traditional SQL joins. It was designed for large uh, fast queries on large scale data sets. And so Druid focuses on aggregating and filtering data across dimensions, uh, which means that, uh, you know, it's not that it doesn't do any joins, it just, you have to do them differently than you might think. But like even this comment, as I was researching this project, this is from this year. So people still think that this is a, a reoccurring issue. But Druid and Jordan's kind of go back a little bit. So pre-2020 and Druid 18, uh, Druid sported some join features like lookups and semi-joins in SQL. And then around, you know, 2020, that's really where, you know, real joins first came to be. And now fast forward to this year, 2023 in Druid 26 and beyond, shuffle joins were introduced and that allows developers to join distributed tables without impact to query performance. And that was all because of MSQ, the multi-stage query engine. But this is all well and good as a history lesson, but how does this work? Like, how do you do them? Sergio, you are the expert in this. Let's talk about it. Well, uh, so yeah, first let's start with you know why you need to do joins. Um, most the uh, analytic databases use some form of star schema or uh, snowflake schema to uh, design the, the, their analytic data model, right? And that is usually in the form of a fact table or some set of fact tables that are attached to a set of dimension tables. And in order to query them, you use joins. Uh, you know, typically you know, may you may have user ID and then you have some user demographics as the dimension. So you join on user ID or product ID or location ID um, along different uh, different dimensions. Uh, depending on the analysis you want to do. So that's normal in uh, any analytic database. Now, um, also something that's true for any analytic database is that if you pre-join them, which is sort of what we're depicting here, you know, you're, you're adding the uh, dimensions directly to the fact table, uh, then at query time, you're going to avoid the join and it's going to be faster. That's true in every database, right? So, so uh, now Druid was designed for the use case of a very fast uh, analytic queries. And uh, in, in order to get the fastest analytic queries, you will need, uh, well, you don't need to, but uh, you, you will benefit from pre-joining the data. Um, one other thought about that is, you know, while pre-joining the data will use more space, uh, at query time, it'll actually use a lot less power, right? A lot less CPU uh, because it doesn't have to process the join at query time and therefore, uh, uh, you know, enables higher concurrency uh, with less resources. So that's something to consider as well. But, you know, there are data sets that, uh, that change over time, you know, slowly changing dimensions or fast changing dimensions that, uh, that don't allow you to do uh, pre-joins. So let's talk about how Druid does do joins. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so we were talking about some of these uh, slowly changing dimensions. Here's a, here's some examples, right? So, uh, uh, you know, in the retail space, which is you know sort of my my, uh, my background, um, you have things like a product hierarchy where you're organizing products in a particular way, right? You have SKUs and then you you group them into subclasses, subclasses into classes, categories of products, and those categories uh, categorizations change over time for marketing reasons or for sales reasons, um, and uh, 
you you typically want to query the data with the latest categorization. So that's that's an example. Uh, customer users, uh, you know, they, they where you have demographics. Well, they're, they're people have lives, right? And things change. They you know they they you know if you have uh, properties like whether they have children, whether they're married or not, th those things change over time. Their location changes over time. So so it, it's another one of those that changes. Um, location regionalization, another example. Now, one thing to consider, though, in in some cases, like customer, uh, you you will have uh, you know, let's say, retail events where uh, you know people are purchasing things. In this example, a a customer at some point in the past that was single purchased a TV. Uh, sometime later, this person got married. Um, so the question is, do you want to see that uh, those sales for that TV aggregated uh, when you're analyzing by marital status? Do you want to see it aggregated in married or do you want to see it aggregated in single? He bought it when he was single, right? So, so uh, you know, it's a question to ask yourself. You may want to pre-join for this reason. Um, anyway, uh, uh, like we said before, the other, uh, there are slowly changing dimensions that uh, will, will require that you join the, with the latest and uh, like I said, product hierarchy, uh, marketing product hierarchies are a common case. Regional sales territories is another uh, uh, another clear one because you don't want to compare, you know, last year's sales with last year's regionalization to this year's sales with a different regionalization. That, that, that's not comparing apples and oranges. You want to have it be apples and apples. So anyway, these are reasons why you need to do joints. Let's go to the next one. So this is sort of the depiction of how Druid does uh, uh, execute a join, right? We have a query on the top left, a simple query that uh, requires the age of the user to uh, group by day, by age group, um, the some statistics, right? Here we're counting distinct sessions and total clicks. Um, <coughs> so in order to do this, we need to join those two tables. Uh, Druid will... Um, you know, the, the sequence of events will be that Druid actually processes like two different queries in order to do the join. The first one, it'll uh, scan that it'll request from the data servers, the user data, um, bring the user data back to the broker. Uh, that needs to be uh, respect the limit, the, the, the max subquery rows, max subquery bytes limits uh, that are set on the system. So you can't bring back too many rows, uh, but th those rows are brought back to the broker they're you know put all together into a single a single data set of all the users and then embedded into the request that's uh, asking for the join and that is sent back to all of the data servers um, in in a way well not in a way it's actually doing a broadcast right it's gathering the user data broadcasting it to all, all the data servers in a second pass at the data uh, it, where it because now all of the uh, all of the data servers have been given all of the users as part of the request, they have all the users that can do the join uh, to the clicks data that they have locally, and uh, and complete that operation, and you know, and then finalize uh, whatever the the calculation here is, do the aggregation in the data servers in parallel after doing the join, and then returning the results back to the broker and back to the user. So this is how the the, the native engine. Uh, does joins in Druid. One thing uh, that's important is, uh, you know, you want to list the, the large table first in your from clause, um, because that's the one that'll drive the, the parallelization of the large query operation or large join operation. So anyway, that's the native engine. Um, let's go to the next slide. So we've talked about uh, Druid doing uh, having two different uh, uh, engines, right? The native engine, which is the one we just described. And then there's the, the multi-stage query engine, which is also capable of doing joints. Um, the multi-stage query engine works, as its name says, by running in multiple stages. And uh, one of the key aspects of it is that it has the ability to uh, reshuffle the data. So it can receive the data uh, organized in whatever way. Um, from either you know Druid segment files in the case of doing a join uh, or from external files um, and then can reorganize it. In this case, we're describing uh, this diagram describes where we're reading the segments locally uh, in this stage one and then reorganizing it by sending all of the rows to all of the workers. Now, this is different than, than the native engine because it's doing it in parallel, right? This is all of the workers uh, talking to each other, each reading their own rows and sending the rows to each other. Uh, so it's also a way of preparing for a join using a broadcast in uh, in MSQ. Um, next slide. 
Now, uh, MSQ also has the ability to do a sort merge join. In order to do a sort merge join, it, what you really do, you it's different. You don't broadcast all of the rows. Instead, you organize the rows by the column that you're joining on. So let's say that join that we're talking about with, with clicks and users on user ID, uh, we would read. If we're going to do a sort merge, we would read the users, distribute them among the workers uh, evenly um, by user ID. So you know here we it's depicted by color. So let's say yellow is one user ID, blue is another user ID, red is another one, and so forth. In, in such a way that the user IDs are distributed evenly across all the workers, and the rows uh, uh, the rows for the same user ID end up in the same worker. Um, by doing this on two different tables, you do it on users, you do it on clicks, you redistribute all the rows such that they end up, uh, the, the common user IDs end up in the same worker and they can be joined. So this is how the multi-stage query engine uh, does joins. It has the ability to do it through broadcast. It has the ability to do it through a, a sort merge join. Let's go to the next one. Um, so, just to conclude, right? Druid does do joins, and it has multiple mechanisms of, uh, uh, to do joins. Um, you know, the, the the one that you choose depends on your use case. The primary use case for Druid is fast OLAP queries, and so you will most likely be doing um, queries in the native engine if you want fast queries. Uh, the, the MSQ uh, queries allow you to do uh, longer running queries that have more complex joins, like maybe fact-to-fact -fact joins that require a, a sort merge, um, but they won't be fast queries. So, so it uh, it complements the, the major use case of Druid, which is the fast queries in the native engine, with the ability to do, uh, to do more complex joins and more complex analytics through the MSQ engine that, that are not so fast to respond. Great. And Sergio, you have another session specifically on joins if people have more questions on how this is done. Right. There is a different session that it's just about joins, uh, and we go into a lot more detail in, on how native uh, queries work and how MSQ uh, uh, queries work. Awesome. So, Especially when you um, mentioned fact to fact, because I feel like that's one of the key use cases that people say like Druid can't do it on, but that's not true. <laughs> not true. Okay. So speaking of things that aren't aren't true. Our next myth that we hear a lot about is that Druid doesn't do updates. And like with this one, like it's not entirely false, right? So there, it doesn't do, it doesn't support, you know, single record updates by primary key. That's one thing. Um, and like, if you want to overwrite data, you can do that using the same mechanisms as batch ingestion, but Druid stores data partitioned by time trunk and supports overwriting existing data. Um, within certain, with using time ranges, right? And so data outside the replacement time range isn't touched, but there's some debate on like how to kind of do this. And even when we were talking about it beforehand, like it's not so cut and dry when you talk about Druid and updates or upserts. So Helmar, I know that you have a lot more insight into how this works in Druid and how it doesn't work. Um, so I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rina. Um, so can you give me the next slide? So first of all, there are a few cases of when you would talk about updates or upserts in Druid. Uh, one is where you would typically have an, an upsert or merge command where you want to replace a certain amount of data by a key range and a time range. Uh, that happens quite frequently in IoT use cases, say you have a range of sensors where you want to replace the data that they read and only for those sensors and leave the rest intact. And um, it also happens in ad tech when you, when you have batch downloads of historical data. And uh, interestingly, in Druid, uh, in the native Druid ingestion engine, we have a way of doing exactly this during ingestion. We have a combining input source as it's called which does a union of, or it can do a union of data that exists with new data. And uh, if you combine that in a smart way with filters, you do it does exactly what you want. And this is depicted in that little diagram below where uh, you have this dark blue um, chunk of data that you want to replace with the orange chunk. And you do that is exactly like that. Uh, I wrote a whole blog about this. It's, it's an interesting pattern. What about SQL? Well, you can do this today in SQL, a similar pattern. 
And uh, it ties back into what uh, Sergei just said with uh, the MSQ engine, we can do arbitrary big joins. And basically you join the old and the new data set together and then have some smart logic to weed out exactly the things that you don't need. And currently this, the SQL that you write for that is a bit bulky, but we are working on making that a lot nicer to look at. So this is perfectly possible. And um, I will in, in the future write a bit more detailed about it. So this is the case of, of bulk updates, but then maybe the other interesting case, and uh, can you give me the next slide, please, uh, Rena, is uh, when you really want to update in individual re records in a transactional way. So these are cases where, say, you're tracking orders, and uh, at some point the order is pending, at another point it has been shipped, or maybe it has been returned, or has been paid or not paid, and all these things. So whenever you have state that needs to be updated, then there are various ways of uh, modeling this in Druid. Because, mind you, Druid is at its core an um, append-only database. So you either append individual records, which is easy, or you replace whole chunks of data. And um, any kind of real-time database, real-time analytics database, under the hood works that way. There are only some that don't expose it that much. So there are basically two ways of uh, modeling these transactional updates. One is by tracking state, the other is by tracking changes. Let's talk about the first one first in a little bit more detail, which is uh, when you track state. So that means that uh, at any given time, you see exactly, for instance, the amount that has been paid for, uh, a, um, for, for an order, or you see the delivery status, the latest delivery status. And um, you keep adding, um, records for a key, which would be the order key in that case, to your database. And uh, then you want to see always the latest one. And um, the way of doing this is actually quite idiomatic. You just do a latest aggregation, which picks for each order the latest record that is in the database. So it's, um, again, a bit... You have, to, you have to learn how to do this. Uh, you have a kind of key, you've got a, a timestamp, and the timestamp um, is the one that gives you the latest state. And um, you can also weed out older state records that you don't need anymore um, by means of data compaction. It's a bit comparable to what uh, in Kafka happens to log compacted uh, topics where you always, if you look up a key, you also always get the latest value. So this is a very, very common idiom. Um, it uh, requires writing your SQL in the right way, but uh, once you do that, then it's quite powerful. The other way, and this is on the next slide, if you can give me that, please, is um, when you interpret your data that is in the database, not as a recent state, but as a change log. So say you have for instance, you have an order and then you've got a payment and then you add the payment. And then at some point, uh, the order has been returned. So the payment also has been returned. So instead of a payment of plus X dollars, then you, you have another record with a payment of minus X dollars. So the way of getting the latest state of the order, like how much money you really have, is just by summing up all the records. That is how you work with the change log. Uh, it is something that is a bit like it takes a bit getting used to if you're coming from a classical data warehouse background. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking event-driven architecture, if you're thinking event sourcing, then uh, this is exactly what you get. And it's very natural to work with those. It's also quite performant. So this is something that uh, is, I think, the, the way into the future. Uh, and uh, well, like so many things around uh, real-time analytics, this requires putting some extra thoughts into your data model. So these are the, when, when you think in terms of uh, data warehousing or classical analytics, these are the two patterns. One is where you track the latest state. One is where you're tracking the deltas as a change log. Now there is another pattern and that is on the next slide, which we also see. And that goes again back to something that Sergio mentioned at the beginning of his talk. Uh, it is about uh, having a um, 
what, what you would think of as a star schema where you have text and dimensions and dimensions are the uh, could be our beloved slowly changing dimensions things that change over time like uh, addresses of people yeah or properties of, of items that you sell and um for that we have actually some some very very performant ways of um handling uh, slowly changing dimensions in druid one of them is that has been around for quite a while is to connect your slowly changing dimension directly to a kafka topic and then uh, you define a key, key the value and you automatically get the latest value for that key out of kafka so that is very very powerful if you have kafka this is a great way of doing things we are also currently and that is something that is happening in imply we are working on a mechanism that well it's actually available in the imply release already that allows you to have a table a druid table in a sim single segment that is broadcast to uh, all the data nodes and it's automatically kept up to date with regular updates and then you get exactly that so basically this is how you model your slowly changing dimensions if you don't want to denormalize them into the table if, if you are uh, concerned about having to update large segments and large amounts of data because of just one column that changes frequently then this may be the way to go for you and uh, these are the main um, paradigms these are the main patterns that you use uh, if you want to model uh, updates and upsets into it awesome thanks Helmar you know one thing that seems to be clear with both joins and updates or upsets is that Druid does things a little bit differently uh, than you know a, a traditional database or something or a data warehouse or things like uh, you know other folks may be familiar with. Um, but that also brings us to another myth that Druid is complicated and difficult to get started with. And sure, there's always a learning curve with any new technology. And if you're here, you probably already are familiar with Druid to a certain extent. But complex doesn't mean that you are on your own. So all of us here um, have put together a lot of materials to help people either learn about Druid, learn more about Druid, get help, troubleshoot if you need it. Um, one of the biggest ones is the Apache Druid Slack channel. Sergio, I know that you're in there all the time helping answer questions, but that is where the community is kind of centered. So you can get help from, you know, other developers at some really cool companies, actually, who have figured this stuff out. Another one is the notebooks. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Sergio? Sure. Um, yeah, please have a look at that. And the link's right there. It's a uh, uh, you know, quick description. It's a, it has a Docker Compose, which brings up uh, a bunch of things. You know, it brings up Kafka, it brings up Druid, it brings up Jupyter Labs, and it also has a data generator. So it, uh, it has notebooks that guide you through setting up, you know, streaming analytics, uh, you know, examples of approximation, uh, using approximations, examples of using tons of different functions within Druid, including a whole notebook on joins. So, uh, with all the examples that we talked about uh, in the join session that uh, you should listen to too. And we also recently launched uh, a developer center here at Imply that, you know, is full of how-tos, articles, videos, kind of everything you would need about very specific topics related uh, to Druid. Um, so that's another, and also kind of like the methodology behind it and why Druid is set up for certain things. That's also there. And then you can also, uh, check out Helmar's blog, which is fascinating. And Helmar, I know that you go in and kind of experiment with a lot of features in Druid and you're kind of, it's almost like a, like a preview or behind the scenes sometimes with some of the stuff that you're talking about there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, uh, I, I know that um, you did a podcast. You interviewed me, uh, so mm -hmm. there's a, a lot more, um, a, a lot more about how and why I blog. Uh, I tend to download uh, and build Druid from the directly from the GitHub repository, so that I can try out things before they are officially released, and then sometimes I write about it. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the podcast, 
you can listen to other developers and their stories, uh, including Sergio and Helmar, who have both been guests on the show uh, at the Tales of Scale podcast. Um, there is a link there, but it's also on all major podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you name it, we're out there. And I think that is going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for attending our session and we're open to questions. Are there any Druid myths or misconceptions you want us to tackle? Let us know.